Hey, future doctors. Thanks for joining me on Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Rhea Mulherker. I'm a student at Drexel University College of Medicine, and I will be your host today. Today, I hope to inspire you all with a breathtaking conversation about obstructive versus restrictive pulmonary disorders. Let's not all cough up our lungs laughing, although I know I'm hilarious. Anyway, obstructive versus restrictive. I'm going to try and hit all the major points. We'll talk about how we use pulmonary function tests to differentiate between the two, and then we'll get into specific diseases within each category. As always, I'm going to do my best to keep you guys engaged by asking lots of questions. Feel free to pause if you need a moment to think, but I really encourage everyone to try and think of an answer. And if you get it wrong, who cares? There's no time like the present to learn. So with all of that positivity in mind, let's dive in. If you had to explain the difference between obstructive and restrictive lung disease to a child, what might you say? To me, obstructive is a problem getting air out of the lungs, whereas restrictive is a problem getting air into the lungs. And if you think back to those lung volume graphs with the tidal volume, residual volume, total lung capacity, all of that, these diseases are reflected on those curves. So what happens to total lung capacity and residual volume in obstructive lung disease? Well, you can't get air out, so both of those end up getting increased because you're retaining air. What happens to those same values in restrictive lung disorders? So in this case, they're decreased because we can't get air into the lungs. So total lung capacity, residual volume would both be decreased. And if we wanted to diagnose these clinically, what tests might we order? So spirometry is a very common type of pulmonary function test, right? And that measures the volume and the speed at which we inhale our air. I don't know if anyone's done spirometry testing before, but they put you in a chamber and they have you breathe in and out of a machine. It's actually kind of intimidating. So what does spirometry give us? Well, one of the curves that we get out of it is a flow volume loop. So this loop plots airflow measured in liters per second against the total volume inspired or expired. And that's just measured in liters. So it kind of represents an entire respiratory cycle. And one of the limitations of a podcast is I can't show you a picture. So if you don't remember it, go back and look it up. But if you do remember the flow volume loop, you'll kind of remember that it looks like a misshapen egg. So the curve of a healthy individual kind of sits right in the center, right? What happens to the flow volume loop in obstructive lung disease? So the curve shifts left, and that represents increased lung volumes. And do you remember how the contour of that curve is affected, specifically during expiration? So during expiration, we get kind of a scooped out curve, right? And do you guys know why? So the scooping actually has to do with the location of the airway narrowing. So initially when you start in expiring, it starts further down in the lung. That's where you have to get the air out of. And so that's actually where the narrowing is in diseases like asthma and COPD. And so that's why we get that scooping of the curve, because initially there's an obstruction. And then contrast that to the curve for restrictive. What does that look like? So it's actually shifted to the right. So that represents decreased lung volumes, and we generally don't see scooping with here. And then with both obstructive and restrictive, we generally see decreased airflow, which makes sense. And then besides just that curve, there's something else that spirometry gives us. It gives us certain measurements that we use to distinguish between obstructive and restrictive. Do you guys know kind of the big ones that I'm thinking of? So I'm thinking of FEV1 and FVC. Do you know what FEV1 stands for? It's the forced expiratory volume in one second. So that tells us how much volume we can breathe out after one second of forced expiration. And then the other value that we use is FVC, or forced vital capacity. What does that tell us? It tells us how much total air you can breathe out within a maximally forced expiration. 
And then we can also use an FV, FEV1 to FVC ratio to compare obstructive and restrictive disease. So let's go through each of these values for the two categories of disease. What happens to FEV1 in obstructive disease? It decreases a lot, right? We're really having a problem getting air out, especially at the beginning, reflected by the scooping in our flow volume curve. And so FEV1 is really decreased for obstructive disorders. What happens to FVC in obstructive? It's also decreased. Like we said, you have a problem getting air out. So what is what happens to the ratio between FEV1 and FVC? That's definitely going to be decreased as well because you have to remember that in obstructive, the FEV1 actually decreases more than FVC, and so the ratio decreases drastically. Now let's go through these same values for restrictive disorders. So what happens to FEV1 in restrictive disorders? It's actually decreased as well. And FVC? It's actually decreased as well. So it's not really useful to distinguish from obstructive. But the value that is useful is the ratio between FEV1 and FVC. What happens to that ratio in restrictive lung disease, guys? So the ratio is either normal or increased because the FEV1 decreases proportionally to the FVC. So the most important thing to remember is the FEV1 to FVC ratios. Do you guys remember what normal FEV1 to FVC ratio is? So the normal ratio is about 0.7, okay? So remember that that ratio is going to be decreased in obstructive and it's going to be normal or increased in restrictive. And then the values of FVC and FEV1, whenever they give you the PFTs, the reference value is generally calculated based on age and ethnicity. So that's what you would expect for an individual of that age and that ethnicity. So in a healthy patient, we want FVC and FEV1 to be within 80% of the reference value. If it's less than that, then we know that there's some underlying abnormality there. But again, just to reiterate, the most important thing you want to look at on the exam is the FEV1 to FVC ratio. It's decreased for obstructive and it's increased for restrictive. Now there's one other measurement that they might sometimes give you. That measurement is, it's called DLCO, or the diffusing capacity of the lungs for carbon monoxide. Do you guys know why we use this, what it tells us? So DLCO acts as a surrogate measure to tell us how well oxygen is passing from alveoli into the blood. And why do we use the gas carbon monoxide to give us that? It's because carbon monoxide is a diffusion-limited gas. That means that the gas does not equilibrate by the time the blood passes through the capillary. The limiting factor in equilibration of the gas is how well it diffuses across the alveolar membrane. And we use carbon monoxide because it imitates how oxygen acts in diseases like emphysema, fibrosis, when there's damage to the alveoli. At that time, oxygen becomes diffusion limited as well. What is oxygen described as in a healthy individual? It's not diffusion limited, it's perfusion limited. So usually in a healthy individual, the equilibration of oxygen depends not on how well it diffuses across the membrane, but rather how much blood flow is coming to that particular alveolar membrane. And so normally to increase blood flow, we have to increase perfusion. Do you know what other gases act like perfusion limited gases. So carbon dioxide and nitric oxide both act as perfusion limited gases. So remember that oxygen in healthy individuals is generally perfusion limited, meaning dependent on how much blood comes to the alveoli. Whereas in diseases like emphysema, fibrosis, where there is damage 
oxygen becomes diffusion limited. And so that's why we can also use the DLCO or the diffusing capacity of lungs for carbon monoxide to tell us if the alveoli are damaged. Now, if they give you the PFTs on the exam, then it's often easy to identify what's going on because all you really have to look at is the FEV1 to FVC ratio and see if it's decreased or not. But oftentimes, these obstructive and restrictive lung diseases, we have to identify based on the presentation. And so I'd like to go through a few cases and talk about the etiology of the disease. So case number one. Let's say an 18-year-old girl comes in. She comes back from college, and she's complaining of this cough for about two months or so. She says she has some associated chest tightness and shortness of breath, and she's occasionally coughing up clear mucus. Her symptoms do wake her up at night, maybe once or twice a week, and when you do your physical exam, you hear some expiratory wheezes bilaterally. What's your diagnosis most likely going to be in this 18-year-old college girl? So I'm thinking of asthma, and this isn't usually the typical presentation of asthma. It usually presents in childhood, um, but in this case, it can present later as well, and so in this case, we're seeing it in an 18-year-old girl. Now, asthma is considered what? Obstructive or restrictive? It's considered an obstructive disorder, and it falls under the umbrella of chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders, or COPD. So asthma is kind of a subtype of that. And what are some characteristics of asthma? So usually the symptoms are exacerbated by certain triggers, right? Like infections, allergens, cold. So it could be that this girl had a cold a few months ago and then this asthma got exacerbated and she can't really shake it. Um, it's often also IgE mediated, right? So we have these preformed IgE antibodies on mast cells and so certain allergens can aggravate it. What type of hypersensitivity would that make asthma then? If it's IgE mediated, that would be a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, okay? The same type that causes anaphylaxis. So what's the pathogenesis of asthma? If you had to explain to someone what happens in asthma, what would you tell them? So it's kind of a combination of things, right? There's bronchoconstriction that definitely happens. You also get some smooth muscle hypertrophy contributing to airway obstruction, and oftentimes the cells in the respiratory tract can secrete a lot of mucus, and so you get mucus plugging. So all of these narrow the airway, and they obstruct airflow. So when we hear wheezing, what we're actually hearing is air trying to get out of a narrowed airway. Now what are the most common spirometry findings in asthmatic patients? You guys are probably thinking so hard back to the talk that we just had. But actually, the most common spirometry finding in asthmatics is normal, because usually they're not having an attack whenever you do the spirometry. So in that case, if you're suspecting that a patient has asthma and they come in to do their PFTs and they're totally normal, how would we diagnose asthma? What might we use? So we can use something called a methacholine challenge test. Methacholine is a muscarinic M3 agonist and it actually exacerbates symptoms in asthmatic patients. Now, what's sort of the key to diagnosing asthma versus any other obstructive process? So the key to asthma is that the obstruction is reversible. So asthma is reversible airway obstruction. Do you guys know how we test that? So on spirometry, we can give patients albuterol, a beta agonist, and that should actually increase their FEV1 by at least 12%. If you can demonstrate that an asthmatic has an increase in FEV1 by at least 12%, you can document a reversible airway obstruction, and that means that they have asthma. What would be DLCO for an asthmatic patient? So it can either be normal or it can be increased. Remember, these patients don't actually have any damage to the alveoli, and so the DLCO isn't affected. Now, let's talk to some of the pathologists out there. What are the pathological findings of asthma? If you take a sputum sample, for example, 
What are two kind of key things you would see there? So one of them is Kirschman spirals, right? These are the desquamated epithelium that you see inside of mucus plugs. They just look like really spirally eosinophilic things. Those are the Kirschman spiral. And then there's another thing that you can see in the sputum. These are also eosinophilic hexagonal crystals, um, and they're made up of this protein called galactin that's from eosinophils. Do you know what those are? So these are called the Charcot-Leyden crystals. These are just kind of two buzzwords uh, regarding the pathology of asthma. So in the sputum, you see Kirschman spirals and Charcot-Leyden crystals. Remember that Kirschman is from the mucus plugs and Charcot-Leyden is from eosinophils. Okay. Now let's move on to a second case. Let's talk about a 48-year-old man. He's coming in complaining of cough, okay? His cough is productive of this whitish-yellow sputum, and he's had it every winter for the last several years. It lasts about three to four months at a time. What would you diagnose him with? So I'm going for chronic bronchitis. He kind of meets exactly the definition of chronic bronchitis, which is a productive cough that lasts at least three months a year for at least two consecutive years. And what do you think he'll look like, just kind of his appearance, based on the knowledge that he has chronic bronchitis? So these people are kind of classically described as blue bloaters, right? Because they're retaining a lot of carbon dioxide, and they're also often cyanotic from hypoxemia. What are some long-term complications in these patients just because of the hypoxemia? So often they get polycythemia so that they can try and get more effective oxygen delivery to their tissues. They upregulate erythropoietin. And then we also see digital clubbing. That's from increased fibroblast activity due to increased PDGF. Um, and so polycythemia, digital clubbing, you'll see these in people with chronic bronchitis, but really you can see them in patients with any sort of hypoxia. And then what would we find in this patient if we were to do a lung biopsy? So hyperplasia of the mucus glands. Do you remember how we measure this? There's a specific tool that we use. It's called the Reed Index. The Reed Index is the ratio between the thickness of the mucosal gland to the thickness of the wall between the epithelium and the cartilage. So do you guys know what normal Reed Index is in a healthy individual? It's about 0.4. In chronic bronchitis, the read index is more than 0.5. So more than half of the tissue is made up of mucosal gland, right? And so they're obviously secreting a lot of mucus, and that's how you can kind of remember that. So remember that we use the read index to diagnose chronic bronchitis. Let's move on then to another case of a 60-year-old man. He comes in, he has a history of smoking one pack a day for the last 30 years, He's complaining of cough. On exam, he has a barrel-shaped chest. He's sort of breathing through pursed lips. And then his chest x-ray shows a really flattened diaphragm and hyperlucency of the lung fields. What are you going to diagnose him with? So I'm going for emphysema. He has kind of that pink puffer appearance. Um, why does he have a barrel chest, flat diaphragm, hyperlucency? What are all of those pointing to? The fact that he's retaining a lot of air, right? This is another obstructive process. And why is he breathing through pursed lips? So breathing through pursed lips actually increases airway pressure and it fights the tendency of the airway to collapse. Now what exactly happens in emphysema? What's kind of the pathology? So emphysema happens because we have a destruction of the alveoli by these elastase enzymes, right? Or just damage from things that you inhale, like smoke. So what happens when the alveoli get destroyed like that? We get enlargement of the air spaces and you, it actually results in increased lung compliance, okay? And so in this case, would the DLCO be affected? Absolutely, you're destroying the alveoli and so the diffusion capacity is limited. So DLCO is gonna decrease in emphysema. Now, what type of emphysema would a smoker have? 
I'm going for sentry asinar. Remember, we kind of divide emphysema into two categories. So I remember that smokers have sentry asinar emphysema because the damage is kind of more central as the smoke is being inhaled. It also kind of tends to affect the upper lobes more. Think of it as smoke rising up. And so sentry asinar emphysema happens in smokers. Now, what if I had asked you guys instead about a younger man? Let's say he's about 35 and he comes in complaining of dyspnea. And then you know from his history that his father passed away from hepatocellular carcinoma. What would his diagnosis most likely be? So I'm going for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Do you guys remember what the normal function of alpha-1 antitrypsin is? So this enzyme is responsible for degrading elastase. In alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, that enzyme isn't forming properly. So what actually happens in these patients is they get a bunch of misfolded protein aggregates of what was supposed to be the alpha-1 antitrypsin accumulating in the liver. And all those aggregates can actually cause cirrhosis and it increases the risk of getting hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, if you were to do pathology of the liver, what would you see in someone who's alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient? Remember you see the PAS positive globules? Remember what PAS stains for? It generally stains glycogen, but it also stains glycolipids, glycoproteins, and so it ends up staining that misfolded alpha-1 antitrypsin in the hepatic cells. Now, sorry to jump all the way down to the liver for a second. Let's go back up to the lung. What type of emphysema would a patient with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency get? Not centriacinar. So this is called panacinar, okay? I remember it this way. In smokers, it's centriacinar because the smoke damage is along the path that it's inhaled. Whereas in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, it's panacinar because you have elastase overactive everywhere, right? Because the protein that's supposed to degrade it isn't present. And so elastase is just rampant and it's destroying alveoli everywhere. Now, that pretty much wraps up emphysema. Let's talk about the last disease that falls under that umbrella of COPD. This one's a little less high yield, but it results from permanently dilated airways from some kind of destruction, either chronic infection of the bronchi or some sort of obstruction. Do you guys know what I'm thinking of? I'm thinking of bronchiectasis. And this one for me was a little harder to conceptualize, but now I kind of just think of it as some sort of damage to the airway that ends up scarring the airway, and it makes the airways wider. Now, who gets bronchiectasis? So a lot of times smokers can get it. There are some other congenital diseases that can also lead to bronchiectasis. So cystic fibrosis is a big one, and then Cartagener syndrome as well. Remember, these are the patients who have dynein deficiency, and so their cilia aren't working, and they can't quite as well evacuate the lungs. Now that pretty much wraps up what I wanted to talk about for obstructive disorders. And just to kind of reiterate, what was the major PFT value that we were looking for in these people? We were looking for a decreased FEV1 to FVC ratio. And what happens to that ratio in restrictive disorders? Right, it's either normal or it's increased. So now let's switch over to the restrictive lung diseases and we'll end with these. So in terms of restrictive, the restriction to the inhalation of air can either be internal or external. When would we see external restrictive lung disorder? Any time that we can't physically expand the chest, for instance, for example, scoliosis, severe scoliosis can impair lung function. Um, patients with ankylosing spondylitis, we actually monitor them with PFTs because their joint disease can become so bad that they can't physically expand their chest wall. And then obesity is another one that kind of limits chest expansion. And then aside from physical chest wall expansion, if you're not able to contract the muscles, for example, if you can't contract the diaphragm to expand the 
lungs, then that could also lead to restriction. So I'm thinking something like Guillain-Barre syndrome or something like polio, where the innervation to that diaphragm is affected. Now, what causes internal restriction? So the restrictive lung diseases internally generally are all some sort of interstitial lung diseases. So the interstitium is somehow damaged. And for these, you often just have to recognize presentations. So let's say you have a farmer or someone who happens to be exposed to pigeons, for instance, and he is coming in with shortness of breath, chest tightness. Do you know what he might have? So I'm thinking of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This is a type 3 slash type 4 hypersensitivity, so it can be mediated either by antibodies and immune complexes or by um, T cells. And do you guys know the most common pathogens that usually cause hypersensitivity pneumonitis? It's usually actinomyces or aspergillus, and so that's why farmers are often exposed to it. What about someone who has a honeycomb lung appearance? That's kind of a buzzword for a specific interstitial lung disease, honeycomb lung appearance. That would be idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, okay? That damages the interstitium, and on CT scan, you can often see that honeycomb. And then other diseases, sarcoidosis can always cause interstitial lung diseases. Remember, that creates the non-caseating granulomas. And then we get into some of the pneumoconioses. These I always thought were really annoying because it's basically just memorization. So let's go over those. Someone who's exposed to a lot of coal dust. In his lungs, you might see some carbon-laden macrophages. What would that be? So this is black lung disease or coal workers pneumoconiosis, right? They inhale a lot of carbon and um, it's reflected in their lungs. And we all kind of have that to some extent, right? Um, especially if we live in urban environments and cities. Uh, what's that called, that finding? You might have seen it on, your, um, on the lungs in your cadaver labs, actually. It's called anthracosis. It's just a little bit of carbon that's sort of in everyone's lungs. Now, what about a person who works in the shipbuilding or the roofing industry? And then they have some calcified pleural plaques. If you were to do a path stain, you'd see some ferruginous bodies that stain positive with Prussian blue. What's this one? This is asbestosis, okay? And asbestosis is sort of different from the other pneumoconioses. Do you know why? It's actually the only one that affects the lower lobes of the lungs. The rest affect the upper lobes. And asbestosis increases our risk of a few different types of cancers. Do you know what they are? So asbestosis can cause bronchogenic carcinoma, and that's the one that it causes more commonly. The other cancer that it can cause is mesothelioma. Okay, so asbestosis increases risk of bronchogenic carcinoma as well as mesothelioma, but bronchogenic carcinoma is more commonly caused by asbestosis. Now, what about someone that works, let's say, in the aerospace industry? You would find granulomas in their lungs. What's this? Beryliosis. And then our last pneumoconiosis, uh, someone that works in the sandblasting industry. You might see some eggshell calcifications on those hilar lymph nodes. This is silicosis. And what's a big complication of silicosis? So silicosis increases the risk of TB, right? And why does it do that? So silica, interestingly, disrupts the same cells that fight against TB. So the macrophages, the phagolysosomes, somehow the silica molecules get in there and cause damage to those, and so those cells aren't as effective at clearing TB. So silicosis is the one that you have to worry about um, increased susceptibility for tuberculosis. And then... Last, for the restrictive category, what are some drugs that can cause interstitial lung diseases? Certainly some chemotherapeutic drugs. Bleomycin and busulfan. They can also, they can both cause lung diseases, right? Bleomycin and busulfan. And then there's an antiarrhythmic. Amiodarone. 
Remember, amiodarone is a drug that can cause crazy side effects. And before you start amiodarone, you always want to get three tests. You always want to get PFTs, LFTs, as well as thyroid function tests because they can cause damage to the lungs, liver, and thyroid. So remember that bleomycin, busulfan, amiodarone, these are all drugs that can cause interstitial lung diseases. And that's pretty much a wrap, guys. You can relax, take a deep breath. Hopefully I haven't ruined that for you with all that talk of PFTs and breathing in carbon. The major takeaway, make sure you know what happens to the PFTs for obstructive and restrictive. Make sure you understand the major diseases that fall in each category. This is kind of a pro tip from my experience taking practice questions. A lot of times, answer choices will have all obstructive processes except for one, and that's how you know that that's your answer, you know? So you want to be able to familiarize yourself with the diseases in each category and definitely be able to recognize those PFTs. With that, I'd like to thank you guys for your time. Thank you so much for listening to me. If you thought this review was helpful, please subscribe to our podcast. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please visit our website at spoonfulofsugar.org and you can post those under this episode. We'll be back soon with more episodes to try and help you as best as we can. In the meantime, just remember that SOS doesn't have to stand for a cry for help. It can also stand for Spoonful of Sugar to help the medicine go down. 